Hello, welcome to another episode of Firm Returns Weekly. This week, we're going to be touching on some news about Warner Brothers Discovery, Tiny Build, Fuller's Smith and Fuller Smith and Turners, and um, a bit on Ecora Resources, and then a little note at the end on Aviva as well. Uh, yes, this one's a little bit late because I was traveling to attend a wedding over the weekend. Um, but yeah, we've, we've got quite a lot to discuss. So let's get into it. So starting off with Warner Brothers Discovery, we have an update about Barbie. So Barbie continues to perform very well and has now exceeded $1 billion in worldwide box office revenue. Its st steeper tra trajectory gives it a good chance of passing the Super Mario Brothers movie as the most successful film of the year so far. Possibly of the, the year in total, but um, we'll have to see how some of the other got another couple of potential big hits coming towards the end of the year. Uh, so I have to see how they do comparatively. Aquaman 2 and Dune being to and uh, Wonka, I think, as well, coming out this year. Um, all being Warner Brothers Discovery titles, but then there are also other ones like um, the new Ridley Scott movie about Napoleon and so on. Uh, so yeah could be some competition towards the end of the year but so far it's looking like we could exceed and you can see this in the graph this uh steeper trajectory on the domestic box office sales domestic being the u.s domestic market uh yeah and a comparison the same comparison we had last time against super mario brothers movie spider-man uh, across the spider-verse guardians of the galaxy volume three and mission impossible dead reckoning part one and then a, again a table showing these showing these figures and how they're progressing along. So and then we've got the Meg to the Trench. So Meg to the Trench was released on Friday and took the number two spot behind Barbie over the weekend with worldwide ticket sales estimated to be $142 million. So it's actually in its opening weekend past Oppenheimer, which is uh, in third place. Um, on its third weekend, uh, same as obviously having released at the same time as Barbie, with the uh, Barbenheimer being the big, big event. Uh, yeah, this is around about I think domestically it's around about thirty to thirty-two million, something like that, and uh, yeah, and worldwide one hundred and forty-two million. So we also had the Q2 earnings for Warner Brothers Discovery. So uh, coming out on Thursday and they had a pretty good impact. They've since listed the share, lifted the share price around about 10%. So pretty well received by the market. I've just got here some key takeaways. So for me, me the key takeaways were the company generated $1.7 billion in free cash flow during the quarter and expects to do roughly the same in Q3. Free cash flow for the year is expected to be in the range of four and a half to five billion dollars. So still within that four to six billion dollars they've they've been guiding for um since earlier in the year, since the, the last annual report. Uh 1.6 billion dollars of debt was repaid in Q2, bringing the total since the merger to nine billion dollars. A further tender for up to $2.7 billion has also been announced. They remain on track to achieve their targets of below 4x leverage by the end of this year and 2.5 to 3x by the end of 2024. Net leverage was 4.6x at the, at the end of the quarter. DTC, direct to consumer, was pretty well break even in Q2 and modestly a bit the positive in H1 despite the increased expenses associated with the launch of Max. Churn from the Max launch was lower than expected, and they're seeing early signs of increased engagement on the platform. That said, they did see a net subscriber loss of 1.8 million during the quarter, largely due to the overlapping subscriber bases between Max and Discovery+. Plus. The introduction of live programming, aka news and sports, is something they're currently working on. Uh, yeah, and something that I found quite interesting was, um, and it's worth listening to the call just for this, 
there were some really interesting insights in the earnings call around how they marketed Barbie across their entire business. And examples included that they had a, a Barbie dream house challenge on HDTV. And then on the Food Network, they had a Barbie-themed summer baking championship. So they're just examples of, with the unscripted programming, being able to do dedicated shows for multiple episodes. And I think they were saying something about the Food Network's show, um, or maybe the other one, uh, had something like 4 million viewers on its premiere. And then it was washed out to um, 142 different released out to 142 different countries afterwards so um yeah it had, it had a wide range and reach and it didn't really cost the company anything because it was content that they would have put out they still made the money from the show and, and what have you so so yeah it's um it just shows you the kind of effect free marketing they can get um and they gave some other examples in there talking about um how they had uh when they were doing some marketing for um House of the Dragon, before that came out, they had uh, like dragons just <laughs> flying across the bottom of the screen on news channels and various other sort of CNN and various other um, media. So yeah, it's uh, they've got all these different avenues that they, they, across the whole business they can they can extend their market. So really interesting to hear how they were sort of talking about that. Uh, they also said that while the ad market is still very challenging, their volumes at the recent upfront are up and price levels remain the same versus the prior year so an overall improvement because last year they notably didn't manage to uh, the merger effectively occurred in, at a point where they didn't have and they didn't have the max by max product and that they didn't get a lot of uh a very big a volume of of uh upfront sales and so they were relying on the scatter market which turned out to not be that great um Whereas this year they they've managed to capture quite a bit more without having to lower their prices. But well, see, there's inflation to consider there. But um, and then finally, the strikes, while destructive in the long run, are actually providing meaningful cost savings and boosting the company's free cash flow in the near term. An estimated one hundred million dollars was saved in Q two, and they were sort of saying that depending on when the strikes actually get resolved, it could be another hundred to two hundred million. An additional free cash flow generation effectively uh, because of the cost savings from it uh, by the year ends which is allowing them to pay down debt a bit more rapidly so the loss of interest might have you could help to offset some of the destruction the some of the, the damage done by the the strikes if they're not resolved quickly but there was some quite positive words said in the call from david's as lab about the strikes so um did seem uh, as in what conciliatory language and so on it does sound like they really are trying to to reach a resolution as a priority um as you would expect it's not it doesn't seem to be uh they don't seem to be looking at it from a hostile um footing at least what with what the, the face they're probably presenting to us um Right, so let's move on to Tiny Build. Um, and I just wanted to, a couple of things to mention uh, this week. Um, so we, we've got the early access release of I Am Future uh, coming out tomorrow. So I'm recording this on Monday the 7th, and it's coming out on the 8th. Um, so before this release, I thought it would be good to provide an update on where some upcoming titles sit in the Steam wishlist, uh, wishlist rankings compared to when I wrote about them last. So first up, we've got Iron Future, which is now number 135 out of uh, versus 165 when I last wrote them, so a really big jump up. And that's, um, yeah, I mean, obviously a fair bit of marketing has gone into getting it there, showing the, the efforts are paying off. Um, and then we've got Streets of Rogue 2, which we haven't got a release date for yet, but it's um, it's on its own moved from 136 to 130 now, so moving up nicely. Um, level zero has gone from 331 to 318. Again, not one that we don't have that we have a release date for yet, and uh, so the final stages of marketing really haven't drive for marketing hasn't been 
taking place, but naturally moving up organically. And then sand, um, another one that's probably going to be 2024, I think. Um, so the first three they've guided are being, uh, well, we know our own future is coming out tomorrow, but Streets of Rogue and Level Zero, um, and then a couple of other ones I'm going to mention later, are, are go guided to come out this year. Um, whether they do or not, they might be pushed back. They haven't got a specific date for them, but uh, but Sound and Ferocious are two that we, I believe are coming out in 2024. So yeah, Sound has moved up from 287 to 270, which is positive. Uh, Ferocious, 146, and it's just stayed in that position, held holding that position. Um, Stray Souls, which is one of the Versus Evil, um, quite promising Versus Evil productions, uh, with a reminiscent of um, Evil, The Evil Within and uh, uh, Resident Evil and all that, and uh, Silent Hill, those kind of things. Um, and that's moved up from 509 to 491. And then probably the most promising from Versus Evil was Broken Roads, and that's moved from 173 to 170. So yeah, all quite quite promising. And then um, something to note is that there are, there are some games that are in early access, and so we don't really, uh, because they've already been released, we don't get the Steam wishlist data for them. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we can't see what, how they're doing before their version 1.0 launch. Um, and examples would be sort of dead side um, is one such example, currently early access, and also Black Skyland, which has a more imminent um, launch in version 1.0. So yeah, Black Skylands is leaving early access on the 15th of August. Um, and while we don't have any wish list data for it, we can say that the following for the game currently sits at 26,212. So yeah, quite promising for the um, version 1.0 launch. Just to put in perspective, I think Punch Club had around about five to 6,000 before its launch, and then that sort of doubled on the launch. Um, and some of the other titles there have gone around about the 10 to 12, I think highest one sort of 14, 15,000 out of the games we just talked about um, that are, haven't already come out in early access. So yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's looking quite promising for that, and that's coming across multiple platforms as well. Uh, when it releases um yeah and then i wanted to talk a little bit about a an article that i read today um on punch club 2 and this was specifically about the uh planning and, ex and execution of the launch of the game and which which went very well and they give you they were given some stats on how it actually did um, and I've included a link here for you to have a look at. Um, yeah, it went very well, and they give you some background as to this was a sequel, obviously. So they give you some background about how they marketed the first game. Some really quite crazy stuff, like um, they basically did a Twitch release of the game first when they did a, a very innovative uh, marketing mechanism for, it. and they give you a little video of this where they, in the chat for the for the stream they had it set up so. Um, the actions that took place in the game were determined by um, the majority votes, effectively within the chat. So they had to, they, they, all the different actions around the game had like hashtag do this, hashtag do that, whatever. Um, and everybody's had to do the hashtag of the item they wanted, in which everyone had the most uh, votes would be what we've taken. And they, they weren't actually, they didn't release the game. They said, right, we're not going to release the game on steam uh for you to buy until you've beaten it on twitch so they, it just drove it drove that engage and, and it really built up a massive hype for the game and it had a really solid launch and um so that was the first game and the second one seven years later um the, and that was an example of some really innovative thing i don't think that had ever been done before this time was the first company to to do something like that so really quite groundbreaking marketing there um but yeah, in the second one, they had to try and work out. Well, so they can't really use the same technique again. It's already been done. How are we going to do it? Um, and so they did some talk about the sort of way they teased the game, how they sort of set up the the schedule for it, how they 
um, made themselves made sure they had plenty of time um, to launch, try and get slots with all the because um, they were doing it across console. That was one way to help get some real hype for the game, um, having it being a bigger release across multiple consoles at once. And then, um, yeah, and they did. They designed the, sh the timings. They they lay it. Alex lays out the timings of when they wanted demos to go out, sort of the size of the demo. It's just so much detail. It's very, very interesting. So I really recommend um recommend giving it a look. I've never seen so much detail about the about the publishing process in in a, revealed in an article like this before. So it's really, really um interesting. And they give you some information it gives some information about um the wish list numbers. So we know the game had around about five and a half thousand followers um ahead of its launch. Um and uh, not sure what the I don't think I actually just see if I can find it. I don't think I actually had a um any numbers for the uh, the ranking the wish list. Oh I think it might have been two hundred and yeah I do actually. I think it was like 222, if I'm remembering. Let me just have a quick check. Just looking back at the my previous write-up. 227. So this was um so it was released on the 20th of July. And this article was published on the 18th of July. So pretty close to the release. So uh, down there would have been that much movement in that time. So 227. And that equated to According to this article here, just over a hundred thousand uh, wish lists, and this well, it does say fresh wish lists. So I'm guessing that's um, because they didn't uh, have this listed on Steam, maybe for a long period of time before. So they're trying to get um, a good number there. But anyway, the, it currently has since that was it at its launch. It currently has. Uh, over two hundred thousand wish lists, so um, this is allowing them to anticipate that it's going to have some meaningful sales during discounts. These are people just sitting there waiting for it to go on sale and to to dive in and so on. So that's an interesting thing. Um, really positive to see. Uh, they 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 put some extra investment into the quality assurance, and it and it really paid off because it meant that the game has now got like a 80% positive uh, rating on Steam, and that that's pretty much entirely down to it not having any bugs, which is really really a major reason for people giving negative reviews. So yeah, very very positive, and it really just helped to drive it. And it had, and as I've I think I said before, it had five and a half thousand concurrent players uh, two days after its launch, as it released. For the weekend and the uh, peak was during the weekend um and they they generated they, they sold over ten thousand copies uh on pc and xbox as pre-orders um and and this this gives you that initial yeah as they're saying here it's important for the day one online concurrent play accounts so getting that sort of um, getting the pre-orders in helps you to really get that uh, that momentum, which I guess makes the game trending. Having because the tr I guess the trending is more to do with the concurrent player counts um, suddenly shooting up um, on Steam. It certainly kind of looks like that on Steam DB. They always give you the current player count on that on that list there. Um, and yeah, it's already the games. It was sold at two times the original cost. Uh, the, the game, the price of the original game, but obviously seven years ago, some inflation is on. But also, uh, it was a a bigger game with more marketing effort and put cross platform straight immediately on launch. So, as that, um, yeah. And, but it's achieved according to this article, thirty sales, um, thirty five percent ahead for the first couple of weeks compared to the original. So you're yeah, really um doing well. And and again, like I said, the original was a a a big success so it's, it's even it's actually done better than that even um yeah and just overall i think i think it's 
it's been very positive. Um, and say, what is the other one? So yeah, just to give you the figures, one point four million dollars gross revenue in the first eighteen days. Um, and the medium time, the median time spent on the game is over ten hours, which is two times the original. Um, and apparently, this is an interesting one. This stat directly correlates to how well your game is going to sell. So yeah, that's an interesting little insight there as well. But yeah, the kind of point I was trying to make was the the looking at those the actual wish list figures here. So if we know the game was two hundred twenty seven in the wish lists and it had a hundred k, a hundred thousand fresh fresh wish lists, but let's just say hundred thousand wish lists, um, then we can think games like I Am Future, which is almost twice as far up the list as that. It's got to be having um, you know significantly higher in the higher hundreds of thousands say i mean we could be i don't know what i mean just to give an example i don't i know that um i know that potion craft um which was a, a big hit game and and went did very well had around about 10 to 10 11 thousand followers prior to launch but i didn't no, I didn't look at the time to see what its wish list ranking was, and you can't really see it uh, retrospectively, I don't believe. Um, so I don't know how where it was in the wish list before its launch. Um, and of course, it was early access before it um, for it released, but in the same as Iron Future. But it looks like it could be on a very sim Iron Future could be on a very similar trajectory if with the early access and then subsequent. Um, version 1.0 launch and going across platform as uh, something like potion craft which is did very well and is, i think drawing in on twenty thousand reviews now or something so you just think about the wish list and we know that it's sold over a significantly over a million copies um a million over a million downloads so yeah i mean we could be hoping for very similar numbers for iron future streets of road 2 as well um and then, yeah, these games that are anything basically that's ahead of if we've got now a bit of a baseline for Punch Club 2, 5,000, sort of five to 6,000 followers. And then, um, yes, uh, uh, yeah, five to 6,000 followers and 227 in the wish list. And it had, we know it had around about 100, um, somewhere just over 100,000. With that equated to somewhere just over a hundred thousand um people that had wish listed it we can now just sort of look ahead and say well this is really could be anything that is ahead of that we could be looking at serious um serious numbers of overall overall sales so yeah it's um and it's also an interesting insight to see how after its release we now have two hundred thousand plus wish lists, which just shows you then the number of subsequent sales you can potentially make um during when the game becomes discounted and so on. So um it shows you the value, I guess, of the back catalogue in this way that if you just keep every time you get the sales, you can just keep driving. Every time you put the it goes on sale, you can just keep driving in more revenue as they have this this big wish list still sitting there after their after their launch. Which is quite promising. And um, I think they, they, I mean, it talks, there's a lot more to in the article, really, really do recommend it, but talk about it here as well about um, uh, wish list aging. So if you've got a game that's um, the wish list, it got, you know, it, it a lot of its wish list growth came quite close to the release, like we've seen with sort of Iron Future, for instance, um, or with Punch Club 2, those convert much more uh directly to sales like a, a much higher percentage goes to sales than than if you had a a wish list that was accumulated over a, a much longer period of time so that's an interesting insight as well um yeah that's um so yeah i recommend the article I've got a link here for it and yeah that was that's it we can and we look forward to the iron future launch tomorrow and it's um it's looking set to be looking set to be a good one i think um so yeah, we can. I'll get back to you next week, and we can have a bit of a review of how it went. Um, but yeah, moving on to Fuller Smith and Turner. 
we've received a notification that Lansdowne Partners, a London-based hedge fund with a value focus, has increased their stake from 8.4% to 10% of the A share of the A shares outstanding on the 1st of August. Uh, so still less, so definitely less in terms of control of the company, but um because of the the other share classes. But yeah, it's it's quite a promising thing to see that stake increase. Um a bit of a vote of confidence there um, from a rather well reputed hedge fund in London. Um yeah, and oh uh, actually, yeah, that and this is I remember reading uh, Stephen Clapham, uh, Clap, Clapham's book. Um, I can't remember the the title off the top of my head now. But anyway, his book, which is uh, which is very good, um, and in his book he actually says one of his criteria that he likes to look for when he's buying a company is especially sort of the London market over to to see who's on the shareholder register, and he's listed out a few different hedge funds that were all very repeat, you know great names to see on your shareholder list shareholder register and Lansdowne partners was one of them so yeah it's quite quite a nice thing to see um and they're increasing their stake um so they're obviously happy with the what's happening with the business and the steps management is taking what have you so uh next we have ecore resources um so we've got some insider buying by the CEO, CFO, and Chairman, um, which occurred on 31st of July and 1st of August. It's always good to see. Um, and then finally, for the company stuff, we have Aviva. Uh, we were also informed um, today about Aviva, which um, and the news was that Close Brothers Asset Management Limited um, has built up a 5.43% position in Aviva with and um, with their £15.3 billion pounds of assets under management. Uh, this 5.43% position in Aviva equates to about £550 million pounds and therefore represents sort of 35 to 4% of their, their total portfolio. So quite a quite a meaningful chunk. Um and uh, yeah, I'm just Aviva is going to be a company I'm going to give a more thorough update on at some point since a fair amount has happened uh, since I last wrote about them at the annual report. So, and I think they've got coming up later this month, they've got their interim their, or their half year results. So I might wait until after that's happened and then we can do the annual report and half year results together along with a few other things that have happened. Like I think they've got a, um, a new art venue in... Manchester that's been uh they've they've got their branding on and some of their sponsoring. Um in, in addition to a, a stadium in in Ireland and they've got uh they've done some fairly big deals to acquire, I think the I think it's the uh home insurance portfolio of Barclays or something. No, I might be misremembering that, but it's a big a big um insurance portfolio. And also um, some bulk purchase, purchase annuity deals, a pretty big one, I think, um, 900 million pounds or something off the top of my head is what I remember. So, yeah, some, some pretty big events have happened that need to be discussed. And finally, um, I continued my investment search and looked through another 50 companies or so this week. And I've ident identified the following as potential candidates for further study. So... These are Global Worth Real Estate Investments, GWI, CLS Holdings PLC, CLI, Marlow PLC, MRL, Bolex PLC, VLX, Tullo Oil PLC, TLW, Kenmare Resources PLC, KMR, and Kier Group PLC, KIE. So yeah, those all pass through my... my filter of looking when I was looking at them as potential things. Some were more interesting than others. Um some of them are the values a bit more hidden in there. Um yeah and I might have missed, you know, with this approach I might have missed some things, but yeah, just just from the screen of these, just well not the screen, but from my 
looking through the financials and and various other things these pass through my own filters and um yeah so that, that if you're interested to for some potential ideas have a look at maybe some of those and i think i've now got it does something like 10 or 11 in total including the ones from last week so out of like i think i'm on i've got up there out of 90 odd companies i've looked at um it's uh yeah i'm doing where am i up to yeah so out of 94 companies i've looked at i've got something like 10 or 11 picked out so yeah and this was of um again all of the companies in the uk that have a market cap of less than one billion dollars was my with my filter basically so i'm just i'm actually working down by market cap so i'm down now to uh, around about the 500 million dollar mark so all the companies i looked through so far have been the on the larger end of that scale and now i'm getting down to the to the smaller ones and towards the sort of micro cap realm oh and just just to place 103 is is full of so <laughs> just going down there. Uh, it's interesting because some some things don't show up like um there are definitely some missing here just because i i filtered out anything that was classified as capital markets because i wanted to avoid just mutual funds and things like that or or other funds that uh appear in here trusts and things uh, it, it still includes uh, real estate investment trusts and another kind of um, certain other kind of structures like um, I believe Ecoral Resources is in here as well, um, but which is obviously a kind of uh, trust structure, royalty investment trust. And um, well, maybe not, maybe not, but um, yeah, it's a, it's effectively a a financial company, a financial entity holding on to a portfolio of these things, but um, it was classified as metals and mining or something, so it appeared in this list. But with Taylor Maritime Investments, it wasn't classified as sort of maritime or whatever. It was classified as capital market, so it got it got filtered out. So there might be some similar ones that have been filtered out, but. Oh well, so it's, it's not a perfect, not a perfect filter. It should probably have expanded a bit more, but yeah, that's where I'm at with it. And it's uh, it's generated quite a few good, sort of promising things to have a look at anyway. Yep, so that wraps up this week. So I'm going to, uh, yep, yeah, I think call it a day there. So I'll yeah give the article a look. You can there'll be a link to that in the thing, and yeah, I recommend giving that. Article I mentioned from Alex, uh, the CEO of Tiny Build. A good look. That's definitely definitely worth your time. Um, if if you're into, interested in Tiny Build, and yeah, I'll uh, thanks a lot for listening, and I'll see.